I'm here at the Royal Horticultural Society's Hampton Court Palace Flower Show. In this second video, we'll be looking at show gardens designed to embrace the future. From dramatic planting schemes suited to an ever-warming climate, to a garden that drives an important message home. And we'll be picking out some great design tricks that can be adapted to any garden. A lot of the gardens here have a message and this garden has a very strong current message. It's a green garden for the future and it's designed beautifully by Jamie Butterworth. And the whole point about this garden is that most of the elements are recycled. So I am sitting on this really beautiful decking, which is actually old crane mats. They used to use these lovely big planks that you can now get recycled, but now we use the rubberized crane mats totally different but these are great to repurpose for this and they're not fixed with any bolts or screw they are just laid on the rocks and the whole weight of them makes them quite secure what I like about this garden is the way he's sculpted it so we've got a lovely deep pool and the water is quite inviting it's almost like a mini plunge pool and I would want to dive in but it goes down to something like 1.8 meters and then they've picked up the sides using the surrounding earth around it so you really feel enclosed but actually the garden is pretty large because we've got different spaces beyond that there's a lovely rill and that rill has a very wide beach and they've done that because the whole point is it's acting as a balancing pond so what happens is when we have these big wet long winters that seem to rain non-stop this water will rise and it will take the excess water and then when it dries down it goes to a level such as this which exposes a lovely expanse of clear beach and shingle they've used recycled materials everywhere now when you actually use flints for building walls and things you have bits of misshapen and smaller bits of flint left over so they've used these as part of the beach. Instead of using EPDM or butyl, which most of us do, they've actually used recycled car tiles, obviously not made themselves, but these sort of items are now becoming readily available and if we can use them, so much the better. The boulders and things have been sort of begged, stolen and borrowed, but they are obviously not new. Even the chairs are recycled. So it all goes towards the theme and it works really successfully. And then the planting really helps the hard structure. I love the way he's used the repeated use of the pollarded willows around the water. They're just grown up on a leg and the leg is about 50 centimetres high and then you've got these massive shoots out from the top and these are probably this year's growth maybe this year's and last year's growth because when you pollard a plant like that it's got quite a lot of roots below and so when you cut it hard it really grows back quickly and vigorously to compensate um, and you would need to do that maybe every two or three years to keep that effect and they used to do it in, in olden times because they'd have them by rivers and then the cattle could graze the ground underneath and then you could cut the willow for use for roofs and thatching and all sorts of things on the top so it really was a harvestable crop and it's lovely to see them back in a garden like this and the planting is very soft generally so we've got lots of pastel shades we've got mauves we've got a bit of blue and it's all packed in quite tightly but then in other areas it is much more sparse which gives a nice differentiation and then so there's some structural planting they've got lovely big copper beach balls and there's, I saw some field maple, which is Asa campestri, those fine trees that they used in the wedding in the cathedral for um, William and Kate's wedding. But here they've got them clipped into balls. So Asa campestri is a lovely native shrub. You can use it as a hedge. You often use it in a mixed countryside hedge. It can be a tree. It can be ball. You can just do about anything with it. It tolerates drought. It tolerates heavy rain. Um, so it's a great part, plant to showcase in different ways. I think this is a highly successful garden and I think it's worth just spending a bit of time in here and discovering the beautiful planting and the beautiful hard surfacing. I'm here in a garden designed for the Mediterranean climate as things move on. It's designed by Tom Stewart Smith. And the overwhelming thing here is the very soft, luscious planting. 
and all the planting is meant to cope well with the Mediterranean climate. I love the breed and gravel path as ever and how they've pushed it right up into the edge of the plant. So although they've compacted the main footpaths, then it just rolls into the plants without actually being compacted and that works really nice. It's a lovely treatment of the edges. Because they couldn't get olive trees because of Xyella, and you cannot import olive trees to the UK at the moment, they've used Eliagnus instead. Um, and actually, they don't look quite so alien. In the UK landscape, sometimes I think olive trees look so Mediterranean, so olive tree, they look a wee bit out of place. Whereas the Eliagnus, which is not quite so silver grey, I think actually fits in quite well to the UK climate. But it is quite difficult to get lovely big specimens of them. I I also wonder with the changing climate that we do get these massively wet winters and I do find that some of the, the dry loving plants don't cope with those deluges of rain that we seemingly get for months on end. So it's quite a difficult thing to actually pitch your planting to climate change because we don't really know what's going on. The hues of the planting is lovely. The blues from the catmint, um, euphorbia, achilles, grasses, and then we've just got punctuations of the brilliant orange of the red hot pokers. They really sing out amongst the blues. And there's lots of ringiums and cardoon, cyanaras, and they all look good too. So it's a very soft, gentle, easy garden, very consistent palette but not really areas to sit in, it's just to wander through and just showcase plants that they think will be good for a Mediterranean climate. These quite large, deep borders are quite difficult to do on a domestic scale in a way. They're quite difficult to maintain because you've got so many different plants all rubbing up against each other that some will do much better than others. Things like the echinacea will probably die out quite quickly. So I think the palette would change quite a bit unless you kept on replacing plants. It's also quite difficult to get in there and weed and maintain them. Um, as you can imagine because they're five, six metres deep and they're totally solidly planted. So you've got to be very nimble on your feet to go in and pull out a creeping thistle or a dot that pops up in the middle. But it is certainly very peaceful. One of the, the stunning things I think of these gardens are these wonderful concrete pots. I saw something similar on another stand and they come in all different shapes and sizes. This one is in rust but you can get all different finishes. I think they're fabulous and I think I'll use some of these pots um, in some of my gardens in the future. This is one of my favourite gardens in the show. It's the Legacy Garden and it's for cancer research. The overall design is brilliant. It's a basic serpentine. I always love serpentines. They're lovely strong shapes and they look and work well in a very organic setting. The paving is actually on a curve that is diminishing as it goes round. This has all been designed on CAD, computer aid design, and they will have cut the stone by putting the CAD program into the water jet machine, which actually cuts it with the water jet precisely to the nearest millimetre or smaller. So you get really tight joints, you get lovely, sweeping, smooth, flowing curves. I love the way you've got the sunken level up the middle of the two curves and that really differentiates the type of space. And at the same time as well as curving in this dimension, it's curving on my side, coming up and down. So you've got the mounds curving and flowing around at the same time. So it all works together, but you're not really aware of this, you just think, it looks great. I love the way he's changed the material as he goes over between the two circles and he's moved it to timber and that makes you think it's a bridge, although it's not, but it very much gives you that impression because you can hear the water from the rill. And then for the retaining wall, he's just done metal steel um, and that's very good because you can cut it to any shape and then he's been able to get these very flowing shapes curving up and round. And then seeds, I mean, these are just lovely big punks of stone. I'm pretty sure they're stone. 
but I'm not sure when I tap them, they might well be concrete. I think probably my only feeling is with the space is you can't actually sit in the sunken lower bit at that point. You just view it and perhaps would like to be able to use the garden a little bit more. The planting is kept in a very organic, soft, full way. But then he's put in big structural balls. He's got lovely big hoogoos, cactus piccata. And one of my favourite trees, the river birch. Everywhere in the show gardens you see silver birch and I'm actually rather fed up of silver birches in show gardens but the river birch likes a wetter situation and has this wonderful textural bark. You just want to stroke it. It's just got so much to commend it and I like the fact he's got this rough tusky grass and then he's got the plant in it. So it flows, it's quite natural, it's extremely soothing but the design is very precise, very well thought out, and it really, really works. I love this little greenhouse behind me. It was designed by Anna King, and I like it because it's handmade of salvage materials, but the attention to detail on this, I think, is lovely. Inside, it's got beautiful drawers and shelves and everything. It really makes you want to pick up your trowel and just get in there and start dibbing. I also love the raised beds with the woven willow and maybe a bit of hazel. We did something similar at Chelsea a few years ago now and I think that's a great look and it's cheap to make, a bit time consuming, but they look fabulous. Don't last forever of course, but there's always a downside. And the third thing I like here very much is the little rail that runs around the edge, which is either willow or chestnut, I'm not sure which, but they've literally just bound the horizontals to the uprights, the verticals with bits of hemp, nice natural coloured hemp string, and it just looks good, it defines the space, and it just goes with the whole look and feel of the garden, which is very much homespun, but beautifully crafted. And it's all about how you might design a garden for an Alzheimer's patient. So they've got wider paths so you can walk down with your carer. It's got places that you can sit surrounded by fragrant flowers. And it's got lots of strong smelling plants because smells really help to make you recall things. Particularly the smell of new mown grass is a key one. It's very simple, but it's very, very appealing. This is the Global Impact Garden by Tracy Foster. And it's all about getting the message across, the message in the bottle across, about the effects of plastics in the environment. And I think as horticulturalists, we have often been using many, many plastic products, fleece, pots, um, and we just use them willy-nilly and then we just chuck them out and nobody really realised until the last few years. And so it's quite a clever way of getting the message across with the bottle. Now the bottle is actually made from metal work and what I think is clever about this is that inside the bottle we've got a completely different environment with very different plants and outside it's much more drifty and soft and more natively looking. And that just shows you how you can make a a, a containment part in the garden with a metal structure. You might not want to do a bottle because obviously that's just to get the message across, but it could be an arbor or whatever. And you can have one type of area inside and then something very different on the outside. So it's all about different spaces and it does it very effectively. And metal is a wonderful material to use because you can make it form any shape at all. You can put all different finishes on it, whether it's acid etch, rusted, verdigris, painted, whatever, gold leaf even. So you've got a wide palette to choose from and you can do any shape. Now, with the fleece thing, I've only just picked up on the fleece thing, and a lot of the fleece that we use, the very thin fleece, is 17 milligrams per metre squared, so it's very light. You cannot really reuse it or recycle it. You can use it a few times and then it just falls apart. But the 30 grade fleece, which is much thicker and heavier, you can recycle afterwards, and you can get many, many years of use from it before you actually have to recycle it. Also, polystyrene plant trays. I mean, I've been using them, which I got from my mother, which she chucked out for many years, 
And I obviously won't buy any more. I don't think you can get them now. And when they go, they go and that's it. Um, and uh, unfortunately, they just don't really break down for a long, long time. So Tracy Foster has done quite an enlightened little garden here. I think she's got the message across very well because people wander past these gardens. You've got to really hit them in the face with the message to make it hit home and I think she will have done here and hopefully many horticulturists will try and avoid these non-degradable plastic troughs, the lightweight fleeces and the polysarin. Well done Tracy.